So I think there are a lot of lessons, a lot of messages we can take from looking at what, you know, what is an exodus? Well, today we can look around us everywhere in the news we're hearing about refugees, people fleeing from something, from whether it's natural disasters, whether it's, um, you know, uh, violent wars and, you know, the cities being bombed or or villages that are so under attack that they can't live because people are getting killed and murdered left and right. And so that's what this was, an exodus. Now, whether that would have happened, you know, the people's worst fears were that their children weren't going to live. And um, I had already uh, already said that people were debating constantly, should we leave, should we stay, what, what's going to happen? And so people who flee make the calculated you know, um, judgment that even though they might die if they flee, that if they stay, the odds are greater that they'll die if they stay. And so even more important is that their children will probably not survive childhood if they stay. So, I mean, if you think about what would cause you to leave everything you know and your families, your, you know, people couldn't leave in packs of, you know, their entire uh, extended family. So even leaving was a question of who goes and who stays. You know, if we can only afford, and these tickets now were incredibly expensive because so many people wanted, you know, a city of six million people, how do you leave? At a certain point, it wasn't how much money you have, it was who do you know? Who do you know who can help get you a ticket on one of those boats, planes, or trains? And so these people were debating, 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 and, and that's one lesson. You know, as we read headlines every day or things on the news that just seem, you know, um, how, that, that people who flee are the worst dregs of society anywhere, actually reading about a, a real exodus that happened 70 years ago, there are patterns, things that happen in exodus is that it doesn't matter what country, what place, what time, what circumstances, um, what drives people to leave everything they know and love is pretty similar, and, and that is, you know, survival. And, and that that decision is never made lightly. You know, the, the people we hear about today who take their babies and walk a thousand miles to a border where they pretty much know they're not going to be welcome, and their kids might be tear gassed or taken away from them, they don't do that unless they think, if they stay, it's worse. And so, Number one, nobody leaves where things are good. You know, <coughs> why would they leave? And this is a country uh, largely of immigrants. Everybody's people came from somewhere else. If they were doing some, you know, having a great life in Germany or in England or Australia or wherever they're from, uh, they wouldn't have left. And, and so part of the lesson is if we can only dig back a little bit, everybody's stories. This is a story about the Ch uh, Chinese the Shang who fled from Shanghai. Um, but what they experienced and how they had to decide and all the turmoil and uncertainty of what's involved in fleeing and planning, uh, where do we go? That's another thing, you know, that all of these are big decisions that families have to make. And, and if you can't afford tickets for every member of the, your family, who stays? Who goes? And so in the case of Benny, he decided not to go because he was a couple months short of getting his college degree. Benny had no money. He knew if he ended up as a refugee in Hong Kong, he would just be one of, of millions of people. He wasn't sure what kind of life, you know, and he said, maybe I would have to become a criminal. I mean, how would I live? I'd be a beggar. And he would rather wait to have his degree because at least then, you know, people might not have money when they flee, but they might have an education, they might have skills, they might have something that they can use wherever it is they go. And so these are things that I, I want people to think about too. These The 70 million refugees around the world today, these are things that they all had to think about. And I guess the last thing is, you know, no country wants refugees. They didn't then, they don't now. And so the idea of people fleeing, they all know they're going to go somewhere where they're not really welcome. Um, so this calculated risk of not only putting your life at risk, 
but putting your children, your families, your loved ones most at risk is um, takes a lot of it takes a lot of initiative. It takes a lot to think about how to do this and to think that you might have a chance of living. And when they get somewhere, wherever it is, whatever place that really doesn't want them accepts them. These are going to be the people who are who are most dedicated to having a peaceful life if they can so that their kids can achieve accomplish have something like an education or a career or a life that they weren't able to have some peace some freedom and so um, so I'm hoping that as people read this story of an exodus that happened 70 years ago you know that there may be some things that connect to say, well, wait a minute, maybe this is something we can also learn a little bit from history so that we don't have to repeat it, so that we don't have to have people like my mother or like people who maybe don't even feel safe enough to tell their stories, to not have to keep that pain inside for so many years, <coughs> decades. Um, because every one of these refugees flees with uh, experiences, incredible trauma to get wherever it is they end up. And, um, and I just hope that, you know, maybe <coughs> learning a little bit of this, maybe feeling a little bit of the humanity and compassion for these characters will also extend to the real life people today that are experiencing this every day. So that's what I hope from my book. And, um, and there are stories that really, I think, are inspiring because people who have, it's 70 years later and more, that this story is told. And these people survived. They managed to make it. They managed to have a life, families, do things with their lives. They managed to overcome incredible obstacles. And hearing this as a writer, or maybe some of you reading it as readers, will think, what would I have done if that was me? How would I have chosen? What, you know, could I have managed the way that these people did? And so I think Really, it's also a story about inspiration, salvation, how to overcome a lot of, you know, incredible things that the world will throw at you. So, um, you are all so attentive and great here. I, I, I thank you so much, and I know we have time for questions, too, so, so I, I, I think we want to do that. So, um, so thank you, and thank you again to Francis for uh, such, being such an interviewer here. Thank you. So, um, um, I'm, we're happy to open it up for questions. Does anyone have questions for Helen? Uh, I mean, I haven't read the book, but just hearing you talk, I want to read the book. Um, it, because it's really great to hear stories of, real stories of people's lives. Um, is there a chance that they might consider it at, for a movie? Is that on the book, you know, on the books, on the books as well. I would love it if they <laughs> considered it for a movie. I'm, I'm not sure. The book has only been out for uh, four weeks now. It came out in January 22nd. So it would take a little bit of time. Um, you know, this book took me 12 years because it's an incredibly complicated story in the way that um, this was one of the most complicated, tumultuous periods of the 20th century. You know, not just involving China, but really all of Asia and the Pacific and World War. So the whole world is involved in this story in a way. And uh, when we hear other headlines in the news, not about refugees, but also about China, you know, is China going to be our, you know, uh, next enemy? Uh, it's going to be one of the, you know, up and coming superpowers. So all of the things that we're hearing now about tension with China, what about <coughs> Taiwan, what's going on with Korea, all of these are elements within this book and part of the history that these people lived. So it won't be an uh, easy story to tell as a movie. I'm hoping somebody will pop up, and if you have any suggestions <laughs> for me, that would be great. Thank you. More questions? Yeah, Sarah. Sure, go ahead. So um, I know that a lot of us also have a uh, similar background, if, if not uh, with relatives coming from Shanghai, but... Uh, Would you like to use this? Oh, sure. <laughs> oh, thanks. Thank you. 
Um, so I know that a lot of us have a similar background with relatives coming, if not from Shanghai, then um, other locations as immigrants or refugees. And I realized that, um, uh, I know that in my case, uh, my, my family um, have been a bit reticent, understandably, about sharing a lot of these stories because they are very difficult. So um, I was wonder if, I wondered if um, there might be an advantage for, for people without journalistic training or background if they uh, were able to perhaps follow a more structured approach which might have something in common with the journalistic approach. I'm thinking about maybe an application like um, National Public Radio's StoryCorps model, something like that, and I just wondered what your opinion might be, whether you think that that generation might perhaps be a little more receptive to a more structured approach, or will they find that invasive, perhaps? Well, I think you... Um what you were expressing about, you know, just the reluctance of another generation to talk about things that were really hard for them. Uh, and it doesn't matter whether it was from China or anywhere else. These, you know, every family has secrets. Every family knows that they have stories that, that uh, you know, I wish grandma or grandpa would tell this. I know there's something there. And, uh, but they, they just get real tight-lipped. And, and here's the thing I discovered. Um, I, as far as structure, I think whatever structure they're willing to accept in telling their story, the key is to is the timing, it's the setting, it's the you know I just happened to be having dinner with my mother that night, and and for whatever, she was now in her seventies. Um, I think it was you know, um, and this is true for Holocaust survivors for. Um, uh, Japanese Americans who were incarcerated during World War II. It was, it took a generation before they would talk about it. You know, it was the grandparents telling the grandchildren. They just didn't feel whole enough, you know, or strong enough to tell it to their children. And, you know, I interviewed more than 100 people. Most of them were in their 80s. Some were in their 90s, some were in their 70s. Um, if they were in their 70s, they were sort of too young. They would have been maybe 10 or 11 at the time of 1949. Uh, the ones who were in their 90s, I discovered pretty soon that I couldn't really rely on everything they said because some of their memories might have, they might have added things, they might have forgotten things, they might have suddenly veered off in the middle of our interview into something totally like, okay, um, I'm not sure now I can trust everything they said. But the people who were in their, in their 80s, they were young adults, they were maybe in their 20s. Uh, at the time of 1949 and the, the revolution. And so they had a, a sort of an adult, a mature view of what happened. But, um, so they were in their 80s. Many of them had not only children, but grandchildren. And many of them were war more willing to talk to their grandchildren about this. Uh, um, to their children, every family has a mythology. They have a narrow story. The story that some of you as parents want your children to know something that will inspire them, make them feel safe, and that they can, you know, just be, be okay. And so that does not include telling them about horrible things or things that were terribly painful. And, uh, and parents want to appear strong. It's not that they want to show times when they were really feeling, you know, um, helpless. And so, um, so for my mother and for these 80-year-olds that I was, was talking to, many of them, I would, uh, my interviews with them wouldn't necessarily be so structured. It would be sitting down with them, trying to make sure they felt comfortable enough to talk with me, have a conversation, to um, tell me things, and, and to allow me to turn on my phone and have a, a recorder going on. And sometimes I would meet them through their children, their adult children. And while I interviewed them, you know, in their living room, their grown child would be sitting in the dining room listening. And at the end of the interview, you know, their adult child would come and say, I never heard those stories before. Are you kidding? That happened? And they would be just amazed of something, just like me, learning something that they had never heard before. Um, 
And so it, it's about creating a safety zone, a comfort zone, um, where they'll talk. Sometimes it's easier for them to talk to a complete stranger. Yes. And so that would be another approach. I think uh, what I'm finding from having written this book is it's giving some families a, a, a structure to talk about talk about something that isn't quite like saying mom and dad or grandma and grandpa did this ever happen to you but instead to be able to say you know I read this thing and this happened and wasn't that around the time that you're you know you were in you know wherever China Taiwan Hong Kong in New York in Michigan you know did did such a thing did you ever hear of such a thing and so that is one way to approach it um, so I interviewed people that I knew had really hard stories to tell. Benny, his father, of course, he was a traitor. He was a collaborator. When Japan lost the war, he was immediately put in prison. And, and Benny's family was cast out of the wonderful mansion that they lived in and uh, became homeless. And so I knew that had happened. On my first interview with Benny, I didn't ask him, what do you, how did that feel with your father being in prison? You know, what did you think about his likelihood of being executed? I mean, I had to develop a, a relationship with him and, and I was so grateful that he was willing to let me talk to him many times over the 12 years that I was working on this book. Um, so the four characters I spoke to, they didn't reveal their feelings and, and their most difficult experiences with me on the first time or the second time or the third time but eventually um, I was able to ask them things that they really did share and in, in Benny's case at some point I asked them so how did you feel about your father now in your 80s and he said he was my father I loved my father but I hated him too I hated what he did to the Chinese people and I hated what happened to our family and he was able to tell me an honest, you know, from his heart. But it took me years before I could even, you know, feel like I, I could ask him that question. And so that's what might take time. It's, I think it's not so much the structure in, in, uh, in having these interviews. And if they're willing to go on StoryCorps, I mean, fantastic. But for the most part, I, I think it's people who are, you know, in your in their living room, in some place that they're comfortable, where um, the setting, the timing is right for them to talk. And if they say, no, I don't want to talk about this, wait a little while and ask again, or find another way to ask it, or put the grandchildren on them, or <laughs> something like that. And they might be, it might hit them <coughs> sometime, like my mother, to say, okay, you want to know, I'll tell you. So never give up. All right, other questions, please. I, I actually have uh, two questions. Um, the first question is, um, when you, you synthesized many conversations, and so how did you present your version of all the multiple conversations for these main characters? How did you introduce them to what your synthesis was and what were their responses? That's the first question. And the second one is, um, obviously you have a lot of recordings um, from a lot of people. What about, I mean, what, have you already archived those in a way that other uh, historians and researchers would be able to access those uh, in the future? Wow. Mm -hmm. Can I ask before you hand that over, are you a historian? I'm not. I'm just, uh, you know, I'm just, I'm interested in story right. and, um, you know, knowing about things that sometimes are, are easily lost because it's not the mainstream or it's not popular. So, and this is, it sounds like it's exactly, you know, no one wanted to talk about it for a lot of reasons. So the first question was, how did I synthesize the conversations with them and put them into a framework, you know, for me to be able to tell a story and to put it into some sort of narrative in a book form. And, um, um, and how did they feel about the way that I was doing this? So, first of all, they all knew that I was writing this for a book. Um, um, I interviewed so many people, and when I did arrive at who I thought the four were going to be, I, first of all, talked to them about, well, I'd like to use your story, I'd like to go more in-depth about this with you. Um, 
Nowadays, as a writer, you actually do need to get permission from people, and, uh, and that's actually just ethical and courteous anyway, um, so that they don't think that I just suddenly became their best friend and was asking them all these secrets of theirs, and you know, like, oh, and I'm going to write a book. Um, so I actually did have to prepare a, a uh, permission um, release form saying that I'm writing a book, that they were aware that I was writing a book, that I was going to use the materials, um, that, uh, and things like that. There are standard things like that on the internet, which is where I found mine, and, um, and compared different ones and structured it for my use. And so my four people, they knew what I was doing. Um, but of course I hadn't written the book yet, so I couldn't show them how it was going to be synthesized. And, and it really wasn't until the book was almost done that I could show them. In 12 years, I actually went through many drafts. And I did not show them each draft. I think that would have scared them, you know? It would have scared anybody. It's like, what? Another one? What? You said, told it this way before, and now you're telling it this way? So, um, so really, the, you know, my plan was really to show them when I had a finished, a, you know, close to finished draft. Um, so because it took 12 years, uh, unfortunately, two of my um, um, four main people have passed away. And I really wish that I had written more quickly. One of those who passed away was my mother. And I had always hoped that every one of them, including my mother, would feel that their stories, once told, that people could see it in a book and they could feel like their lives were, had some meaning to other people. So um, two of them have passed away. One of them has dementia. And um, the one who was the youngest, who was two, when uh, I started the story uh, with her. So she's now in her early 80s. She's, um, you know, sharp as a tack. She, I was worried about how she would uh, interpret this because, and how she would see it, because she's a writer too. And so, so I knew that she might be the most critical of all. And, um, and so she actually came to one of my book readings. I, I had sent her the, the, the uh, proofs of the book, you know, early on. And crossed my fingers, crossed my toes, held my breath, you know, hoping that she would not be offended by anything, that, that she would feel that I told her story in a, in a, um, with integrity and giving dignity to her story and, uh, and was honest with her story. And, um, and then she called me and she said she felt, you know, she felt good about it. She, you know, and, and I won't go into all the, you know, very nice things that she said, but, but um, there was a couple places where she said, you know, that really wasn't my uncle, that was my cousin. <laughs> and so it was still at a time where I could change that. And, uh, and, and that was fine. That, I mean, that was great that she could help me um, make sure everything was accurate. And she came, uh, she lives outside of Philadelphia, and her daughter is near. And so both she and her daughter came to my um, um, book reading in Philadelphia. And of course, that's a little nerve-wracking, because there she is right there. I introduced, her name's Anwa Annabelle. She adopted the name Annabelle later. And she was sitting there, and I asked her to stand up so people could recognize her. And, and later I asked her daughter, who is, you know, a fully grown adult, and I asked her daughter, how, how does your mother feel about this? You know, she said, oh, my mother feels so validated by seeing her story, you know, being told it's in a book that all of the hardest hardships she went through in her life were being read and appreciated by other people. So. So she said, um, she said that, and then her daughter said to me, and it makes me just feel so much more um, understanding and gratitude for my mother, for what she had been through. So I, I really felt like, you know, it can't be more wonderful than that. 